Good afternoon. I'm Ira Selkowitz. I'm the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. Along with the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative at the University of Colorado School of Law, we are pleased to bring you Pink Collar Crime. We'd also like to thank the accounting department at the CU Denver Business School for also being one of our presenters. Our co-sponsor is the Colorado chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and they are the ones providing the two hours of ethics CPE credit for those of you that are seeking that in the business world. The namesake of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is Bill Daniels. He was a pioneer in the cable television industry and also a sports team owner, and his success in business was due in no small part to his practice of ethical business principles. And these principles, which are the hallmark of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative, are integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, fairness, respect, adherence to the rule of law, and creating long-term value for all the relevant stakeholders. They're over here on the banner. They're on my lanyard. They're everywhere. When, when uh, Bill passed away, his estate went to the Daniels Fund, a private charitable foundation that he had established. One of the programs of the foundation is the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, which provides grants to instill principle-based ethics at the collegiate level in the four state region of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. And those are the states where Bill Daniels did business. The, the collegiate program is comprised of 10 business schools plus the University of Colorado School of Law. The major goal of the ethics initiative is outreach to the business community. And this program is an excellent example of how we do engage the business community and, and outreach to them. We have about 200 people already signed in on Zoom plus our audience here today, and they're from all over the United States and some internationally. So for those of you on Zoom, um, and there's just a few administrative matters before we begin. For those of you on Zoom, please use the Q&A button to ask questions of Kelly Paxton, our speaker. And we'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the program and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And we'll be taking questions here live as well with a handheld mic that we'll be passing around. If you have a tech issue and you're on Zoom, uh, please use the chat button. So it's the Q&A button for questions for Kelly Paxton and the chat button for tech, tech issues. Now, for those of you here in person, uh, we have a networking reception uh, and the food and, and drink will still be out. Um, so we invite you to stay afterwards to speak with Kelly and anybody else that's here. That would be a great networking opportunity. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Kelly Paxton. Kelly Paxton has more than 20 years of investigative experience, and she's a certified fraud examiner, private investigator, author, and founder of the podcast, Great Women in Fraud. Ms. Paxton started her career in law enforcement as a special agent for the U.S. Customs Office of Investigations in 1993. Ms. Paxton was recruited by U.S. Customs for her expertise in finance. She worked white collar fraud, money laundering, and narcotics cases. She was also responsible for the district's undercover operations and financial reporting of these operations. Kelly worked as a contract investigator doing over 1,000 security background investigations for the Office of Personnel Management and the Department of Homeland Security. Kelly has worked in both the public and private sectors. Most recently, she worked as an investigator for Nike. Her investigations include embezzlement, conflict of interest, intellectual property, and open source intelligence, and fraud. She's also the proud owner of the website pinkcollarcrime.com which is a passion of hers about embezzlers in the workplace. She founded Great Women in Fraud in August of 2020, and her book, Embezzlement, How to Prevent, Detect, and Investigate Pink Collar Crime, was published in December 2020. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Welcome, Kelly. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So I have to say, um, I'm a little intimidated because Mary Dodge is here. And if you got a copy of my book, she wrote um, 
a testimonial on the back. And it was just heartwarming to me that she would do that. So um, I just, yeah. Um, you heard my sort of story. And my story is such that we think of criminals as bad people, bad guys. And I thought that for a really long time. I was a special agent for U.S. Customs. I was armed. I got to drive fast cars and didn't get speeding tickets. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and I put bad guys in jail. However, the highlight of my career, and I'm sorry to say this to you and to Ira, is um, I got a lawyer, a female lawyer, disbarred and put in prison. But most importantly, I got the $2.4 million returned to the victim. So my career has always been about money. I was in finance. And I learned how people invested and saved money. And then I went to customs and I learned how people stole money. Now, my last sort of career is I say I'm a fraud therapist. And I don't want to say money is the root of all evil, but it is a lot of the time. And um, it, my last career is I'm a fraud therapist because you know what? Anyone can be ripped off. Just anyone can be ripped off, unfortunately. So we're... Who here is familiar with the term pink collar crime? Who has heard it before? Okay. Okay, a few of you. Okay. Also, you know what? I give out pink candy too, FYI. Okay. I'm all about the brand. And Mary and I went shopping today and I got a pink RFID credit card thing. So I'm writing off my taxes because it's pink. Okay. FYI. Um, so when Ira reached out to me, I was just thrilled. I was like, oh my gosh, because ethics is so important to everything. It is just so important. And you're going to see how important integrity is and act with honesty in all situations. And I think about tone at the top and culture with that. Trust. Build trust in all stakeholder relationships. I am also known as the fraud hashtag queen. Hashtag trust is not an internal control. I have had only one victim who said, I never liked her. And I'm like, well, she still stole $450,000 from you. And he's like, how? And he goes, I didn't like her. I didn't give her access to my checkbook. And I'm like, you have this thing called a visa machine? And he's like, well, yeah. And I go, she refunded all day long. And he goes, I have a wine tasting room. You taste the wine. And if it's yummy, you buy it. There should never have been a refund. And I was like, well, she refunded all day long to the tune of $450,000. He's like, I knew I didn't like her. But every, all my other victims loved their person. And that is where I'm the fraud therapist. Money is replaceable. You can sell more widgets. You can sell more of your time. But the trust that is broken by that nice person that you brought into your home, into your business, you will never forget it. And that's when my world of crime and criminals and bad guys changed. So we have Elizabeth Holmes. Okay. Now, who is going to be brave enough and get a big cherry pink? Who thinks she's pregnant again? Okay. Here. Big cherry. Uh, <laughs> it's always a little dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, there was a picture of her last week and there she's got the belly going. Um, that's called plead the belly, by the way. And it's a real thing, um, isn't it? It's a real thing. So um, everyone thinks because she's a woman, she's a pink collar criminal. Now, for a long time, I had to say alleged. No, she's convicted. She keeps pushing off her sentencing and, you know, pretty soon she'll be having a baby in prison, hopefully. She is a white collar criminal through and through. Now, another thing that I will not do in this presentation is I will not victim shame. And you're going to see why. However, the victims of Elizabeth Therina or Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos, I'm going to say I'm going to shame them all day long. Sorry, you know, rich old white dudes who just had FOMO and wanted to get in. Yeah, well, you deserve to lose your money. Sorry. I know that's just, I'm very politically incorrect. Okay. She is not a pink collar criminal. So you're going to learn three things today. The first one is there is no honesty chromosome. Women don't have it. I know we would like to think we have it, but we don't. Sorry, we do not have it. Um, the workplace continues to evolve. And that's why I think this 
is kind of a hot topic. I was actually, um, true story. I, I do not exaggerate in my stories. I was actually um, <laughs> deposed a couple of weeks ago and someone said, it says you're a renowned pink collar criminal expert. What is that? And I'm like, I'm the only fool who talks about it. Like, uh, I guess that's renowned. And he didn't really like that answer, but, but it's because the workplace continues to evolve. Look at this room. It's probably half and half. It might even be more women than men. Um, but the workplace continues to evolve, and that's important. And finally, never underestimate a woman. Again, never underestimate a woman, because if you do, she may rob you blind. My dad was the victim of a little workplace incident, and he said, when he told me about it, he goes, you know, I always knew Barb was smart. I just didn't realize she was smarter than me. And I'm like, yeah, dad, she was because you weren't paying attention part of the time. So she knew when he wasn't paying attention or showed up to work hungover, maybe. I don't know. Um, never underestimate a woman. So we have pink versus white collar crime. White collar crime, the Bernie Madoffs of the world. It is basically, you know, Ponzi schemes, financial statement fraud, bribery, foreign corrupt practices. It's, the, it's kind of the Wall Street. It's the crime on Wall Street. Now, and this is hard for me to do this because I have the wizard of criminology in front of me and I'm like, oh God, I'm gonna say something wrong. Okay, 1939, Edwin Sutherland, a crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of his occupation. Now, what's funny is also, I have a very weird sense of humor. You guys are gonna find out. He made this um, announce, or presentation at the American Sociological Society. Who wants to give that acronym and get a pink candy? No one wants to give the acronym, but everyone's nodding. They, <laughs> okay, they, um, they changed it to the American Sociological Association. Smart on them, okay? But what was interesting is up until 1939, we did not think of criminals as like rich white people. We thought of as icky poor people on the other side of the tracks. And Edwin Sutherland comes along and goes, oh no. Now I know he is controversial. He's made it about the offender versus the offense. And I have a little issue with my pink collar about that, but I don't have a PhD, I just pretend. Um, but up until 1939, crime was on the other side of the tracks. It was poor people. We didn't think of rich people. And then, you know, we've got Bernie Madoffs and all sorts of people that we could talk about. So that's white collar crime. And we're gonna give that a big umbrella. And then it's gonna take 50 years, half a century. And Dr. Kathleen Daly, she popularized the term. She didn't even come up with the term. It came out of the Wheeler study, didn't it? Yeah, the Wheeler study in Yale, Princeton. Princeton or Yale? Yeah. And, um, this is the definition, low to medium level employees, comma, primarily women who steal from the workplace. That's it. Everyone thinks that it's, I'm picking on women, which I'm not. And you guys are going to say, I'm weird fraud, sense of humor. Women, if you're going to steal, steal like a man. Okay. No one's going to steal here. Okay. Because we're here to learn ethically not to do it. Okay. Now, this book is a seminal, was that a good word? To, 1975, Dr. Frida Adler. And I had the absolute pleasure, and I looked back in my notes, it was 2013. I sent Dr. Frida Adler an email and I said, I would love to talk to you. And she literally sent me back her phone number and said, call me. And I had a 45 minute conversation with her. I hear she's ill. But in 1975, what was happening in 1975 with women? Helen Reddy, I am woman, hear me roar. Yeah. So I talked to Dr. Adler. She had over 300 media appearances. Barbara Walters interviewed her. She was on The Tonight Show. What criminologist has been on The Tonight Show? I, I asked for the archives. They didn't even keep it. They didn't think it was important. She was on To Tell the Truth. Um, and everyone was chipping at her, saying, how dare you take away from women making strides in the workforce? That wasn't her theory at all. It was not her theory, um, but she kind of brought gender into, you know, crime. 
it's the rise of the new female criminal. Now, oh, oops, okay. Oh, this is, it says, okay, stealing from veterans, hashtag stealing from veterans. Former American Legion bookkeeper pleads guilty to stealing more than $140,000 in Colorado. Um, is anyone familiar with this case? Anyone familiar? So look at her. She's a, you know, regular looking person. Would you cross the street if you saw her? She's not scary. I could plant her in this room and you guys wouldn't know that she was here. But she stole $140,000 from the American Legion. And um, <laughs> actually, a district judge wouldn't accept her plea at one point because he didn't think it was strong enough. So, but she stole $142,000 and she spent it on um, retail stores, online merchants, insurance companies, grocery stores, restaurants, airlines, things like that, lifestyle. She's not like Bernie Madoff. She's not flying private. She's not, doesn't have a yacht. She's just stealing little bits here and there. Wherever I go in the United States or even virtually overseas, I can find local stories like this. Then you have this guy here. Hashtag, it's position, not gender. It's so important to remember. Now, this guy's name is um, Aaron Victor Seha. He stole more than $770,000 from the California Department or Colorado Department of Transportation. He used his P card. Don't we love those P cards? Doesn't it make life so much easier? Huh? Yeah. Did it with the P cards. He actually um, submitted bogus invoices. He did a vendor fraud, and you're going to find out men are more likely to do vendor fraud than women. But um, it's position, not gender. So pink collar crime is low to medium level employees, comma, primarily women who steal from the workplace. 90% of all bookkeepers in the United States are women. They know every dollar that goes into a business and every dollar that goes out of a business. They're down in the weeds. So here's just the story on the Denver DA. When I worked at the sheriff's office um, for Washington County, that's where I changed my whole idea of crime because I wasn't dealing with bad guys anymore. I was doing embezzlement on Main Street. And all of my suspects, but one, were women. And I said, he stole like a woman. And you're going to hear about how he stole like a woman. Um, and I Googled the term women embezzlers, and that's how I got to pink collar crime. But then when I dug into it more, and for many years, I did just highlight women. But um, it is all about position, not gender. Women are just in the lower level positions. But I'm at the sheriff's office, and I'm seeing these women that literally live in my neighborhood. And they're thieving. And we don't relate to Bernie Madoff. He lived on the Upper West Side or the Upper East Side. He vacationed at his home in the Hamptons and in Florida. He had yachts. We didn't see him at the grocery store. But we see people like this guy at the grocery store and her at the grocery store because they live amongst us. So that's where I like to say that embezzlement is the crime on Main Street. And we just don't pay attention to Wall Street. That's for rich people. So many people really didn't care about Bernie Madoff's victim. It's wrong. Numerous ones actually committed suicide after they found out all their money was gone. So, but generally, most people think of the people that were victims of Bernie Madoff were just a bunch of rich people. Well, so they had to cut out one of their country clubs. It's not true. Not true at all. Um, so this chart I like to show Women's incarceration rates in the United States. If you look at about 1975, all of a sudden it goes up. Now, I know someone here is going to go drug war, drug war. Yes, absolutely. Even if we get rid of three quarters or seven eighths of the increase, it's still an increase, a huge increase. In Oregon, the next state prison will be a women's prison because our women's prison is overcrowded. They never planned for the fact that women would go to jail. Like, women don't do that. But what happened, Dr. Adler said, women, the fraud triangle. Opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. Women did not have opportunity until they got into the workplace. Now they have it. And just like men, they're humans. 
they will steal given the opportunity. And I think she's right. Again, people take issues with Dr. Adler's um, statistics. I, I'm not, I don't have a PhD. I don't know. <laughs> I'm scared. Um, so, uh, but women are in prison. They just are. Now, it was, I believe, two summers ago at nine o'clock in Oregon, 9 p.m. at night, and all of a sudden I get an email. And I was like, oh, okay, who's that? Well, it's David Weber, for, and he's in Florida. And um, he's like, Kelly, I can finally statistically prove what you have been harping on since 2009. And I'm like, how can you prove this? And he's like, I'm doing my doctorate of business administration. He looked at five years of US sentencing on embezzlement cases. And at the last minute, his doctoral advisor said, throw in gender. He wasn't even thinking about gender. And he's like, Kelly, women steal more often. But men steal more money. That is my experience. Now, again, I have a BA. Is it a BA? Yeah, it's a BA, not a BS. Okay. I know enough about statistics that males 43.5%, females 56.5%, 13% statistically significant. And this was out of um, almost two, a little over 2,000 cases. And I just talked to David Weber in the last month, and he's expanding it to 10 years. So I cannot wait to see what it says for 10 years. These are only federal cases. And in my experience, a lot of embezzlement cases are done locally, local municipalities. The feds sometimes aren't too interested. It kind of depends. But 13% females over males. Women steal more often. However, men steal more money, which you're going to find out about. Again, it's the elephant in the room. My daughter went to a historic all-women's college. I want women to succeed more than anything. There will be, I guarantee it, please be nice to me. Um, one person in this room who says she's awful, don't ever have her come back again, please don't. And there's always one in every class. There's just always one. I am not picking on women. I want women to succeed more than anything. I did this presentation a couple of years ago before COVID, 38 women, women in insurance and financial services and two brave men. Again, I told you I have a weird sense of humor and I'm like, okay, women, go steal and steal like a man. And like, they all laugh. Okay, it's not funny. No one should steal, okay? No one. But if you were to go to a judge and say, um, I stole less than a man, so can I get less than a man? They're gonna laugh you out of the courtroom, okay? Again, it's position, not gender. More women are in lower level positions than men. It's just kind of the way of the world. Now, who here practices good dental hygiene? Everyone? Okay, well, I'm going to ruin that with some thoughts, okay? So I'm going to throw you some thoughts, okay? Let's, oh, oops, okay. Sorry about that. Um, fun fraud fact. The next time you go to your dentist, tell them, hey, I heard this crazy statistic that three out of five dentists get embezzled. And if your dentist doesn't say anything, bingo, they've been embezzled. I pretty much put my kids through private school thanks to dentists. Why is dentists? Anyone want to guess why dentists? Yes. The pardon? Most front office staff are women. There's a yes. Out of network cash, you'd be surprised at how many people have to pay cash. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the next time you go, but make sure that they have um, already given you the Novocaine before you say that. Otherwise, you know, you might be hurting through that cavity, okay? So um, who here? Okay, they won't appreciate the zots. Um, so has anyone seen this movie from Kate Fraud? I know. Yeah? Did you like it? Okay. This is so, who, you know what? I have a fraud like museum in my office, but I just moved, so I can't bring my stuff with me. I have all sorts of things. Okay, you want to start? There's a lot of energy in fruitcake. There's a lot of energy in fruitcake. I'm Bob McNutt, 
I'm the president of the Collins Street Bakery in Corsicana, Texas. What Dom pairing on is to champagne, Collins Street Bakery is to fruitcake. My mother thought it was delicious, so she was delighted when she got a fruitcake every year for Christmas. Collins Street Bakery is about a $30 million a year business in terms of total sales. They make good bank off of fruitcake. Mm, it's really good. There was a few years they didn't understand why the bakery wasn't making money. We knew something was wrong. But what do you do? Start accusing everybody? When everything came to light, we were all standing there stunned. It was a huge embezzlement scheme. He got caught with his hands in the cookie jar, literally. It was close to 17 million. The FBI came down with a ton of bricks. <laughs> they brought in investigators. They brought in forensics folks. They brought in accountants. It's definitely the strangest case I've ever worked, <laughs> without a doubt. I did not think that I would have a massive fruitcake fraud in my career. Do you not like fruitcake? Not really. <laughs> he spent a lot of money, private jets. Prada, Louis Vuitton. A lot of jewelry. You don't throw a Rolex in a lake. Who does that? If my husband had bought them a new Mercedes every few months, I would have known there was something up. <laughs> that someone could keep up a lie like that that long and to keep doing it. Predators are predators. They're gonna get you any way they can. How did they pull this off? This is a real stunt. How did you do this? Pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. All those lies are gonna catch up with you one day, and they did. It's hard to keep a secret in the can. You can try all you want, but it's gonna always come out. In retrospect, you can look back and say, you should have seen this coming. Now, where is this documentary going to be shown? So, as part of my podcast, oh, oh. <laughs> as part of my podcast, I actually interviewed the documentary producer, and it was delightful. And one of the things that I really like about um, the, oops. No, maybe? No. <laughs> okay, there. The Sandy Jenkins embezzlement scandal. And if you're interested, reach out to me. I can send you the blog link. The crime that shook our bakery to the core. They say only 15% of all embezzlement cases get turned into law enforcement. Only 15. Well, it's embarrassing. There's shame and humiliation. So they do this blog post, no victim shaming. How could they not know what was happening in their own company? You might be asking yourself the same question, but it's more complicated than it sounds. Don't worry, we'll walk you through the whole thing. However, just as time transforms tragedy into comedy, it also transforms embarrassment into education. And I, so brave of this company to be able to put this out there and to be part of a documentary so other businesses can learn from their embarrassment. I mean, who makes fruitcake jokes? Everyone. So I went out and on eBay, bought a fruitcake tin. It's in my fraud museum, literally bought it. My grandma had so many and I threw them all out 20 years ago. Um, so now here's the FBI agents taking stuff out of the house. Looks like a pretty nice house, doesn't it? It's not on the wrong side of the tracks. It's not like get it some ghetto house. No, it's a nice house. I think it's just a normal human being that finds themselves in a situation in which they have an opportunity and they succumb to greed. That's simply it. Many of them have the idea, I am going to pay this back. I'm not a criminal. I have found spreadsheets in desks of what people have stolen. Spreadsheets, because they all think it's, they're going to pay it back. They're going to win big at the casino. And my one thing is, is like, how are you going to put that journal entry back in? You think they might notice it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an accountant, but I do know journal entries, okay? But they think they're not a criminal because they haven't done this before. 
After learning more about the embezzlement, what are the takeaways? The lesson is threefold. He likes things in threes too. Embezzlement is a more common crime than we are led to believe. And that's why I talk about pink collar crime all the time because I want to like, I, I said, I want to normalize embezzlement, not the act of it, but the reporting of it. Most often the motivating factor is not greed, but need or a perceived sense of need. And victims of embezzlement aren't bad business people, just a tad too trusting. Again, hashtag trust is not an internal control. So it's a great blog post. Um, and here's the guy, again, it's position, not gender. He was like a $50,000 a year accountant. And all of a sudden he shows up in, you know, Mercedes and Rolexes, and you're gonna hear about the parking lot audit. Um, you know, hashtag it's not rocket science. Um, he wasn't plan on, planning on doing it again. He'd gotten his car, his token of hard work. He was going back to being an honest, ordinary guy. He was not a crook, but it was just so easy. And you know, the funny thing is, is like the fruitcake sales, they knew something was happening. They literally thought it might be because of Johnny Carson, because he started making so much fun of fruitcakes. They like, well, maybe we're not selling enough. You know, it's, and the young black woman that you saw in the clip, she's the one low level employee who discovered it. You know, they had had consultants come in and they couldn't figure out what was going on. I'm like, all you have to do is walk through the parking lot. Um, but McKinsey doesn't do that. Oh, are there any McKinsey people here? Sorry. <laughs> okay, we're not gonna make fun of them. Okay, so there he is with his wife, Sandy Jenkins and his wife. They're flying PJ, private jet. And um, this is a story I heard from Deanna Sullivan. They were so well known at Neiman Marcus, AKA Needless Markup. Those were their nicknames. They literally, the salespeople called them fruit cake and cupcake. I mean, I like Nordstrom's, but I don't have a nickname, okay? Do not have a nickname. So there they are. And you know, psychologically, when you, if you watch the movie, you're gonna hear a lot about him. He, has, he had some issues. Um, so now, okay, we're in academia. And um, this young woman, Jamie Patrone Coddington, I believe, look at her pink dress. I'm pretty sure it cost a lot more than my pink shirt, okay? There she is. $40 million from Yale. Smart people, Yale, huh? I can Google any Ivy League school and find an embezzlement. Not a problem at all. $40 million. She admitted to stealing $40 million um, uh, in computer and electronic hardware. And guess how she was caught? Another one of my favorite hashtags, tips find fraud. Who's an auditor? I love auditors, love auditors, okay? Um, but tips find fraud. Okay, uh, my biggest cases have come from tips. So we love the alert line, love the alert line. So ugliest Range Rover I've ever seen. That's a crime against a Range Rover personally, okay? She forfeited more than $560,000 and turned over a fleet of high-end cars, including two Mercedes, two Cadillac Escalades, a Range Rover, no offense, a Dodge Charger, really? Like, was that her starter car? I, I, I don't know, but ugliest car ever, sorry. I want a pink Range Rover. If I get a pink Range Rover, I've been stealing, okay? I'm just gonna tell you guys, that means I've been stealing. Look at a $5,000. I look forward to trying to purchase this on the US Marshall's auction. So maybe I could buy it for $500, look at that pink. That also is a crime. Um, so yeah, $5,000 for that purse, it's, Ugly. And her husband was a little bit of part of her scheme. And there he is in pink. They don't even know they're pink collar criminals because they didn't come to a presentation like this, okay? She should have. Um, she actually got sentenced to nine years in prison and she's gonna sell like three houses, her ugly cars, um, but they're never gonna get close to $40 million back. Now, I would think Yale would probably have a pretty healthy insurance policy, let's hope but um, she is getting nine years in prison and it's healthy. Now, okay, I, I am all about people paying for their crimes. 65 years for stealing $200,000? Uh, that's steep, that's the other thing. No one in this room is gonna steal, but if you do decide you have to cross the line, um, 
you might want to do some Googling about sentences in your municipalities. Because in Portland, if you steal $200,000, you literally scoop elephant poop for a couple of weekends, and that's it. But if you're in Rosenberg, you're going to prison for 65 years. The sentences are, can be over the top. So if you are going to steal, steal somewhere like Portland, okay, no, don't come to my hometown. Um, females, this is part two, females in the workforce. It used to be 70-30. Now look at the room. It's pretty even, isn't it? It is pretty even. This guy, Chris Marquet, um, he used to do this report on embezzlement. He did it also based on sentences, over $100,000 in federal court. Um, he hasn't done it since 2013 because it's really laborious. Um, and I've reached out to him like, hey, and he doesn't respond to me. But um, he used to do this. I use some of his statistics. Now, I love being a certified fraud examiner, but the report to the nations is a survey. It's not based on statistics. It's, you know, and it's also give your largest one or case, one or two. Well, that's going to skew to men because hashtag men steal more. Um, so he does it based on statistics. David Weber is doing it based on hard statistics. Um, but one of the things that just came out in 2022 for the report to the nations from the ACFE is 43% no background check, 57% yes. That has increased from about 52%. So about a 10% increase that it's increased. Or no, is it 10? I don't know. My math isn't so good sometimes. Um, I do background checks. In Oregon, you have to have a legitimate reason to run a credit check. You can't just willy-nilly run credit checks. And there's ban the box and things like that. So, But this number has increased about 5%. And I think it's due to COVID because there's remote workers. So I think people are just doing more background checks. That's just my guess at it. Um, however, do perpetrators tend to have prior fraud convictions? 6% had prior fraud convictions. For many years, it was only 4%. Now that is a 50% increase. I know that much about my math. Um, so that's kind of big that it's gone from 4% to have prior fraud convictions to six. Now, if someone steals within six months of starting a new job, they did it at their previous job. That's my rule. It's anecdotal, but it is my rule. They didn't learn it at the new job. They learned it at the old job. When I worked at Nike, there was a young woman who stole, and I knew the detective who came and responded to the case. And I said, oh, she did it before. And he goes, she's got a clean background. And I'm like, she did it before. And he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, because she started stealing right away. And look at where she worked before. They have a terrible tone at the top, terrible tone at the top. And he still didn't believe me, but I'm like, whatever, you know, I've done this for a while. Um, what does the glass ceiling have to do with embezzlement? Well, this comes from the ACFE. And you look at men, women. When you're employees, they say it's 65% male, 35% female. But it's in the ACFE report to the nations, that is all fraud. I only do embezzlement. So manager, 75-20, men to women, it's a little bit more money. You get to owner or executive, way more men, more than twice the amount of money. And that is my personal experience also. The higher up you are, the more you're gonna steal. You have access to more money. My biggest case is men higher up by fraud or tips too. So um, now this comes from Chris Marquet. And again, this one was the 2013, I think. If you look um, between 40 and 49, he says the median age is 43.6, I think, when they start stealing. But if you look to the far right, over age 70, aren't you supposed to be retired and living in Sun City? What are they doing stealing? They get social security, don't they? Like, we don't need to, they wouldn't steal, they get social security. Come on. No, they still steal. Let me tell you. Meet Maxine. 87 years old. Now, I did this presentation for um, an IIA chapter, the one in Portland, and it was online. So, you know, her engagement, 
I said, put in a hashtag. And someone put in the hashtag, don't trust grandma. Well, let me tell you about grandma here. 87 years old, she was a 50 year employee of the township, almost 50 year employee. Her husband got cancer. She stole $27,000 to feed themselves. I will not sit in judgment of Maxine Brinks. So at the end of the day, I get an email. Hi, Kelly. I want a book, but I don't deserve it. I'm the one who said, don't trust grandma. <laughs> and I was like, you get a book anyway. You didn't know the story. I am not going to sit in judgment of Maxine. I just finished writing a chapter on um, empathy and investigations. We never know what is going on in a person's life. I will not sit in judgment of them. But just because they're old doesn't mean that they can't steal. Like, come on. It doesn't mean it. So who is she or he? Are they disgruntled? No, oh, there is one guy that's disgruntled, uh, Gary Foster, but he was unusual, an aberration. They're generally the employee of the year. I even have a picture of the employee of the year parking spot with the woman's name and she got busted for embezzlement. Like, come on. I, ah. um, they love their job because they're getting more than one paycheck. And the second one, they're not paying taxes on. Guess what? No one steals to pay taxes, except Nathan Mueller. He stole $8 million and he did pay taxes, but he was an accountant. So if you guys are going to steal as accountants, pay your taxes. Um, so he doesn't have restitution. It's shocking. Um, but they like their job. They really, truly, generally like it because they know they're never going to get paid like that anywhere else. Does anyone know who she or she is? You do you know? You don't remember? Oh, okay. Um, this is Bernice Geiger. I get another question sometimes, whereas, well, my niece works for me. My daughter-in-law works for me. My nephew works for me. They wouldn't steal from me, would they? Ha! I can show you family members all day long. There was a woman in, um, Vail, it was Vail or Aspen. Her sister stole like a million dollars from her. Like, yeah, sister. She thought her sister wasn't paying her enough. Um, so Bernice Geiger stole from her dad's own bank for over 40 years, the equivalent of $17 million. This was on Freakonomics, so I believe it. She was exhausted when they arrested her. Exhausted. Because she could never take vacations. Because auditors don't show up regularly. So she couldn't take vacations. So she goes to prison for five years. Um, she, gets, she gets divorced, surprise. Um, she gets out and she moves in with her mom and dad. And I've told my two kids, uh-uh, can't happen. The irony of me being pink color crime queen and you guys, uh-uh, not gonna happen. Um, and the rumor is that she started work consulting for the federal government, the FDIC. And she looked at people who weren't taking vacations. So I had this nice pediatric dentist she was so cute and um, she was getting ripped off. And so key cards, key cards are genius. Um, I said, I need to know when she's been in the office. In six and a half years, she took one and a half days of vacation. Her husband had surgery for cancer. Nope, didn't miss a day. Um, she got in a car accident. She came in the full neck brace, didn't miss a day. Um, she had a couple of clues. If you have an employee whose car gets repoed in your parking lot, it's a clue, okay? But the dentist is like, she's dedicated. And I'm like, no, she's not, she can't. She's in here and she was cutting side deals and taking cash on Fridays because dentists don't work on Fridays. So, um, but we could prove that, you know, she was in the office every Friday. She's like, she didn't need to be. And I'm like, yeah, she did because she's cutting side deals um, with cash. So employees that don't take vacations, they're hiding something. They're absolutely hiding something. So no vacation, you know, banks make you take two weeks. Um, if you're gone for two or three days, you just work a little extra. If you're gone for two weeks, people have to do your work. And that's when they find that, oh, bank account that we didn't think we had. Or the bank account, I thought we closed. Oh, no, we still have money in it. And it's going in and out. So no vacations. Um, so this one, I think I can read this one. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, let me. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? 
Ira, are there any questions in the Q and A? Okay, none. Yes. Oh, we're getting to there. Yeah. Yeah. The right. Well, so in medical offices, they call that woman generally. Um, they call her the second wife. So I work out at this club, and um, this woman found out what I was, what I did, and her husband was an ophthalmologist, and um, she said, and I explained to her about dentists, and she goes, "Oh, the second wife." And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, oh, and she was older. She's like 75 at the time. She goes, oh, you know, all us doctor wives, we all talk. And that nice office manager, she's the one who buys me my Christmas presents, my anniversary presents, sends flowers to me. Like she's the second wife because my husband relies on her. You know, this is a different generation, but they refer to the second wife. So yeah, the lack of segregation of duties. So I got interviewed in New Zealand's North and South magazine. And they called it the female fraud squad and they only did female embezzlers. So in the end, it was a dodgy belly that did her in. After embezzling $419,000 over seven years from Linfield College, Rhonda Crabb, who was the accounts manager, was undone not by accountants or auditors, but by food poisoning. Crabb's junior staffer noticed a $2,300 discrepancy and it all started to unravel. Now, I'm not going to say to give day old potato salad if you think someone's going to stealing from you. No, I would never, ever say that. Okay. Um, we have a little quiz here. Does anyone know what an aptonym is? An aptonym? Okay. True story. My dad, um, before he died, he wanted to be cremated. He was Catholic and, uh, okay, dad, fine. So, he passes. My sister and I go to the funeral home. We walk into the funeral home. Hi, Kelly and Carrie. My name is Bill Burns. And I just start busting out laughing. And my sister's like, Kelly, Jesus. And I'm like, Bill Burns, he's going to cremate dad. She's like, oh, she's a little slow. Okay. <laughs> that is an aptonym. Now, there is a woman named Donna Steele who stole $15 million from a company in North Carolina. I am not going to hire someone with the last name of Steele. Okay? So now you guys are going to start recognizing aptonyms all the time. Okay? Just FYI. Okay. Um, see? Fun, fun fraud facts. Um, they're control freaks. And what does that mean? When the business owner wants something, oh, I'll get it for you. Oh, no, don't worry about that. I'll take care of it. They lock their desks. They lock their files. And they don't, like, literally, they don't even give the owner their own password sometimes. No joke. Don't ask the owner, what's the password? I don't know. She or he has it. Okay, I'm going to have to start here. They are control freaks. Segregation of duties, you just make life easier for them. You make life easier for them. Ken, this is, when I quiz for CPEs on Zoom, um, I ask, what's your favorite hashtag? For auditors, it's always this one. Auditors and trust. You guys trust everyone. Trust no one. I trust no one, okay? Um, a fraudster living beyond his or her means is the most common red flag. I call them pink flags um, by a sizable margin. Ever since 2008. I'm going to go ever since, I don't know, the beginning of time. People don't steal to save. They steal to spend and shop and buy cute pink things, okay? Um, I went through this period of doing fraud haikus. Embezzler's top trips, you know, it's five, seven, five. Disney, Vegas, Hawaii, lifestyles are pink flags. Um, I would tweet those. Um, by the way, anyone on Twitter, follow me on Twitter if you want to. I tweet all sorts of fun things, truly fun things. I go to bed every night with Google alerts on embezzlement and I have lots of crazy dreams. Um, now, I was at the University of Portland way before COVID, and I did this for the Beta Alpha Psi group. And um, if you have an employee who is married filing zero and goes to single filing 10, or if they always contribute 10% to their retirement and they go to zero and take a 401k loan, that is a cash flow crisis. And then I'm saying, and if you have an employee that has a judgment, and this cute young undergraduate, Ooh, Kelly, 
Um, actually, Mrs. Jackson, um, what's a judgment? And I'm like, something I hope you never have in your lifetime. And I had to explain it to him. And um, it's, it's a clue. If you have an employee whose car gets repossessed in the parking lot, it's what we call a clue. Okay, they're having a cash flow crisis. Now, not everyone who takes a loan out from their 401k is going to steal. Not at all. And actually, I did it for ISACA. And they're like, oh, my God, we're going to go back and run data analytics on 401k loans. And I'm like, no, you're not. Lawyers will stop you cold. Okay, let's hope that's what lawyers are really good for. So we behave. Okay, um, but ISACA members thought it was really fun to do that. I'm like, please don't do that. But now I don't have employees. And certainly not one's named Steel. But this would be my interview. So you're really good with pivot tables. Yeah. V lookup, all that sort of stuff. At the end, when I see that everything is good, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to go to Las Vegas this weekend. Do you like Vegas? Okay. If you say yes, just pretend to say, yeah, I like it. There's the door. Bye-bye. See ya. Go away. That's my line in the sand. Um, was the, the, the female or the comedian, uh, I think it's uh, Louis Anderson, he's passed. He lived in Vegas. He said, look at your house and look at the casino's house. Who's going to win? The casino. Chris Marquet says that one out of four of his embezzlement cases were related to gambling. It is my line in the sand. I have had personal experience with a family member who just loved the slots. I hate gambling. So, sorry, I've done this work at casinos. I even post pictures when I go to casinos of me like pretending to touch a slot machine. And I'm like, don't believe what you see on social media because I literally don't gamble, not even a penny. Going to Vegas, gambling is an issue. Um, Disney, all of these people, and this is only one of my montages, have stolen and gone to Disney. Now, I'm pretty sure Bernie Madoff took his whole family to Disney and we didn't see it. But when regular people, and look at that family, they're both kind of in pink up there. They X'd out the daughter. Um, Disney is expensive. I went to Disney this summer. I took my sister and my daughter one day, parking and tickets, no food. I mean, we did eat food, 500 bucks. My sister's like, can we stay at the Grand California? And I'm like, no, $1,000. So if you have a $40,000 a year employee going to Disney and staying at the Grand California for a week, that's a $20,000 vacation. It doesn't make sense. That's those lifestyle red flags. Now, I, I, Disney is the happiest place on earth. And I literally, I just want to go up to people. Did you steal to get here? No, um, I think I'd be kicked out of the park really quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and I have whole other montages. It's, you know, the Eiffel Tower. It's a trip that does, that is not commensurate with their salary. Okay. We love Disney. Um, now this one, yeah, she went and of course filed false tax return. That's the other thing The never, the feds sends to prison for embezzling from her employee and filing false tax returns, they always charge wire fraud or failure to pay on the stolen money. Like that's just what they charge. It's just, yeah. So now look at her. She's got a pink shirt on and her LinkedIn thing. Yeah, she got caught embezzling at her bank. The FBI went and looked at her bank and there she is. Now, I will tell you, I pulled up her LinkedIn. I went and I found her on Facebook. And um, her Facebook, all sorts of pictures of her and her kids. I was not going to pull her Facebook. I'm not going to shame her with her kids. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. LinkedIn with a pink shirt, I can shame her, okay? Um, now, this young, do we have any horsey people here? We are in Colorado. Okay, yeah. Horses are expensive, Okay. And um, this is Laura King Kaplan. And her mom, Melissa King, um, stole $42 million from the Sandhog Union in New York City. And her daughter was such an accomplished equestrian, she leased a horse to Jessica Springsteen, the boss's daughter, who won a silver medal last summer in Tokyo. Um, now, I'm not picking on horse people. And I actually did this presentation for eyesight software 
600 people all in line. I think it goes great. And, you know, get out of the webinar. All of a sudden, an email pops up. You are the worst person. I make huge sacrifices for my Arabian horses. Why are you picking on us horse people? There are kids who play classic soccer. There are kids who ice dance. And I immediately reach out to eyesight software and I'm like, oh my God, I am so, so sorry. And they're like, one out of 600, don't worry about it. I wrote her back and I'm like, I, I apologize. It's my experience. And then I wanted to say, P.S., show me an ice dancer whose mama has stolen $42 million and I'll put an ice dancer up there. But I have yet to find an ice dancer whose mom has stolen $42 million. Rita Crunwell, who stole $53 million, had over 400 horses. Horses are expensive. But if you're a dude and you do race cars, I'll put a race car up there. It's just, it's the idea of the lifestyle, not matching. Um, yeah. So this is a parking lot audit. Um, there's a guy in, he's about two hours from me. One day, he's the CEO of a company. He looks out the window and he's like, oh, there's Rhonda. Rhonda's got a nice new Cadillac Escalade. Huh, that's interesting. I know what I pay her. And then he starts paying attention to her because he underestimated her. And she starts talking about her horses and stables. And so he starts looking into her $842,000 Rhonda Mulligan stole from the CEO. And unfortunately for him, it was out of his personal accounts, not the company accounts, so there was no insurance. Um, but all it took him to do was looking out the window and seeing what car she drove up. Now, Dr. T, who was a dentist who got ripped off, when we told him, um, you know, the money is missing because CFEs don't do guilt or innocence. We just say the facts. He's like, well, she does have a later model BMW than I do. And I'm like, that's what we call a clue. And he's like, but she told me your husband has a really good job. And I'm like, then why is she working for you for $18 an hour and has three hours a day of commute? Well, it was because she lived across the river in Vancouver, Washington, and she was under investigation for stealing from another dental clinic there. So if the car doesn't match the salary, it's a clue, okay? It's what we call a clue. Um, okay, candy time. Who wants to tell me, oh, and look at you guys, pink Skittles, they're um, smoothie Skittles. Okay, first person you kiss, the name of them. Okay, come on, be brave. Kevin, who said that? Okay, Kevin. Okay, now I'm gonna embarrass you even more, hopefully. Um, the third person you've kissed. You gotta think about it, don't you? But see, the first person you remember right off the bat, the first person you remember right off the bat, now I've done this work with a forensic psychologist in Portland. These are good people who cross the line. The first time they cross the line, they remember that person. Now, they remember the amount. So there was Lisa, who stole $250,000 from urologists. And I asked her, so Lisa, tell me about the first time you stole. It was a Friday, it was $8,000. I walked to the bank, I got a cashier's check. I walked back, I'm like, okay, get the picture. Um, okay, what about six months later? I don't know, I stole. It's just like your boyfriend, you didn't. You remember it because these are people who have always been on this side of the law. And when they cross that line, they remember the first time, but then they're just like, eh, I just stole. So always ask them about the first time, especially if you know the dollar amount of the check. Nathan Mueller, who stole $8 million, his amount is like 27,800. He kept a spreadsheet because he was an accountant, but he does remember the first time. Yes. When, so when somebody's caught that first time, What's the percentage if you catch them the first time that they'll steal again? Oh, what's the per percent? Well, we never catch them the first time. I mean, it's so rare to catch them the first time. Um, and actually on my podcast, which is now rebranded as Fraudish, my most recent episode with Diane Catani, the first time was actually a mistake. The travel agency booked 
a personal trip on the corporate card. And she found out after the fact. So it can be a mistake, but we rarely catch them the first time. So, yes. Baby fog or baby mind. Oh God, did I mention that? No, I have widow fog. Um, uh, oh, post-pregnancy. Post okay. Um, well, it's been a long time since I've had that, but <laughs> I do have widow fog <laughs> and uh, it's not pretty. Um, well, talking about like this, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it, but confessions. Um, I mean, some people may want to try and block it out. Like they may want to try and block it out. Um, I don't think they're going to be very successful. Now, okay, this doesn't count for psychopaths and narcissists. Okay, so if you have a serial grifter, a serial thiever, none of this makes sense. But most of these people are good people who have made a bad choice. And actually, I learned that from a criminologist, and I'm totally spacing her name, because she used to work in parole and probation. And the biggest thing was, you can't say it was a mistake. They have to own that it was a choice and a decision. So very careful about the wording about that. And when actually I see like white collar criminals who are like, well, it was, I'm like, oh, dude, you're not, you're nowhere close to being over this at all. Like Andy Fastow, if you listen to interviews of him, he does not take responsibility. So, okay, so ask him about the first time. Now, okay, so then we have the video for, um, did anyone watch that terrible TV show, Pink Collar Crimes? Okay, you're gonna get a clip. And I said, I've been stealing consistently from the PTA. I've worked hundreds of cases as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. And in all those years, criminals have waltzed into a police station and confessed exactly never. Usually it takes hours of interrogation and mountains of evidence to get an admission of guilt. And even then, it almost never happens. But after four years of skimming from the PTA, Providence's conscience clearly got the best of her. Point I said I Yeah. Okay. They confess. Marsha Clark, no one would confess to Marsha Clark. She lost OJ. Come on. Like she's just forget it. No one would confess to her. It's so they did this show, eight episodes of Pink Collar Crimes in 2019. My website would get blown up every weekend. They did not ask me to consult on it. Two out of the eight cases were actual pink collar crimes. They made it about women murders, women coupon clippers, women mortgage fraud. Um, didn't even look, bother to look up the definition of pink collar crimes. It did not get renewed. And Marsha Clark is not a pink collar crime profiler. So not. you. I, I, I'm gonna say I'm 100 for 100 for my confessions. I'm empathetic. I don't pound on the table. I don't make them feel like a piece of dirt. Um, I had a um, boss with a, from a former three-letter agency that maybe ends in an I. Um, I did an interview and in his office. And um, at the end of the interview, you know, we were kind of laughing, the suspect and I. He had shown me his phone with the text messages that show he did not do what he was alleged to have done via the tip line. So he leaves and my boss comes up to me and he's like, what was that about? I'm like, uh, he's innocent. And he's like, I don't ever want to hear laughter in my office. I want tears. And I was like, oh, dude, okay. Well, I didn't last, okay. Let's just say Kelly did not last there. Um, if you are going to pound on the table and tell them that they are a terrible human being, they won't give you butt kiss. Now, can you imagine pounding on the table to Maxine? What were you doing feeding your husband after chemo? Like, come on. These generally are good people who have made a very bad choice. They also are relieved. When they confess, they all know the gig eventually will get up. I, not serial grifters, um, but they're relieved. And now I am... Skittles and rainbows when it comes to fraud. Like, I'm not going to leave you guys here with this. God, she's so depressing. Because my cases, 
both victims and suspects, their lives have been improved after the gig was up. I've had business owners who have tripled their revenues after they had an embezzlement because they kind of started to learn where to look at the books and to do segregation of duties and things like that. Lisa, who stole the quarter of a million dollars, she's a waitress. She says she's never been so happy in her life. She had a very high pressure job doing medical billing. Happy in her life. So not all fraud is terrible eventually. There is a silver lining to fraud. So you're not going to leave here and go, oh, God, I'm so depressed. I promise. They will confess if you give them kindness and empathy. And you need it. Because when I worked at the sheriff's office, we had to write a search warrant, an affidavit to get bank statements. It took months. Whereas you could ask your suspect, well, you're being so helpful. Let's just go online and download your bank statements. And they do it. Now, if you're a jerk to them, they're not going to do it. And do you want to wait months to get bank statements? Now, you know, the other thing is they don't go to trial because the money's here, goes here. It's like they plead guilty. They just, they confess and they plead guilty. They want to move on with their lives. Now, I don't always show this slide to everyone. This comes from Chris Marquet, embezzlement scheme. The number one way, forged or unauthorized checks. Hashtag, it's not rocket surgery. Um, I'm not a CPA, and I just heard CPA stands for can't pass again. I couldn't pass the first time. No, I only took like one accounting class. I like accounting. I like things to tie off. But forged or unauthorized checks. Cops don't become cops to play with pivot tables, except for Kelly. Um, they become cops to play with guns. But the cops have to prove the cases. So these cases aren't incredibly difficult. Um, you know, it's money is here in the business and it goes here to the suspect. It doesn't go from here to Liechtenstein to Panama to Dogecoin to here. Here to here, maybe to their visa, that's it. It's a, pretty much a straight line. When it starts going to Dogecoin, I'm out, okay? Um, tips find fraud. Look at hotline, 42 to 58%. Everyone needs a hotline. And I know some hotlines can be very expensive. If you have a question about a hotline, I have a great resource for an inexpensive hotline. They do great work. Um, you know, especially with the younger generation, the tips come in hotline via text, you know? So um, hotlines are so incredibly important. Um, now, this is the gender. This comes from Chris Marquet. Now, if you look where you see forged or unauthorized checks, women, 41.6%, men, 26.9%. Now, my son is 25. My daughter is 23. If I were to need something forged, I'm going to my daughter. My son should be a doctor. He can barely write his name, okay? It's just what we do. And then from earlier, that CDOT scheme, vendor fraud scheme, men 14.9%, women 3.1%. Again, the position. What position do they have? What access do they have? It's that. So, um, and in my experience, anecdotally, this is it. It's not that hard to do it. Segregation of duties. Um, uh, Tom Hughes, who closed the 2019 ACFE Global Conference, um, he was kind of a serial embezzler. He's reformed. He's one of my felon friends, and I have lots of felon friends. Um, and uh, he was an outside bookkeeper. And when his clients would come to him, they had an envelope. And if the envelope were unopened from the bank statement, he's like, bingo, I can steal from them. He goes, if they had just opened it, I wouldn't steal from them because I think that they'd actually, you know, looked at the bank statement. So mail your bank statements home or be the first person to the PO box to get them. Rita Crunwell, who stole $53 million, she got the mail. And when she was out of town, she had like her nephew get the mail for the town. Like that's wrong. Um, so mail the bank statements home. You have to be the first one to get it with 
you know, software these days, if you have a thousand dollars in your account, I can make it look like a million. Not a problem at all. There's a guy who, um, he's a famous speaker and I can't remember his name. I listened to a ton of podcasts and I was out running and <laughs> they're like, so how do you, you know, manage the financial part of your very successful speaking business? Well, my business manager calls me every Friday and tells me what my balances are in my five accounts. And I literally stopped dead in my tracks. I'm like, he tells you trust, but verify. Like he goes, yeah, my business manager just calls me up every Friday. We have a very set phone call every Friday. And he just tells me how much money I have. And I'm like, trust, but verify, dude. I'm just waiting to see him being ripped off. Okay. Um, not really. Cause we don't victim shame. Um, two to count and mix it up. I did this for nonprofits and someone put in the chat at their church, husband and wives cannot count the collection. Friday night lights football. You don't have the same two BFFs count the money, mix it up and count it and have a camera. I consulted for a water district and I was like, so where do you, you know, count the money? And he's like, well, right here. And we have a camera right here. And I'm like, but what if she steps over here? And he's like, oh, hmm. maybe a wide angle, like maybe, okay. Two to count and watch it. Um, I know this seems really silly. A password is like a toothbrush. Now in Wyoming, I spoke to the Park and Recs group, funnest group I have ever spoken to. Those people can party. Um, and I do this and I show this. And one of the vendors, comes up to me after my presentation. And he's like, I need to tell you my story. He goes, I was in my twenties and my boss came to me and asked for my password. And he's like, he was my boss. I gave him my password. He goes, fast forward six months and all of a sudden the police department calls me, says you need to come in. Well, his boss has, has used his password to steal. And this is 10 years later and the guy is still, like it just brought it right back to him. Now, I had a dentist who's now ex-wife made everyone use her password because she was preparing for her eventual divorce. And um, so when there were journal entries or deletions, she's like, well, we only have one password. Key cards. So all the journal entries and the deletions were done either remote access, no one had remote access, or after 8 p.m. at night, we could show there were no employees in the office past 6 p.m. She literally did it on the stand and there was a mistrial. Like her attorney is like, ah! Um, Nathan Mueller's boss gave him her password. He stole $8 million. She was found to have nothing to do with it. She was fired. Don't share your passwords. Please don't share your passwords. Um, so this is from Idaho. They sent me this cute little present. I like to surprise and delight. What do I mean by that? So a woman, Alma McGammon, stole 800 and some thousand dollars from the city of Westland. And um, Alma had a really bad gambling habit. She even won a car at the casino. Um, but she knew the auditors came every June. She would thieve up until May 31st, cold turkey for a month, and then start up again July 1st. Now, if they just moved the auditors one time to October, it would have been caught. If you only look at checks over 5,000, pull one for 500. That's what I say, surprise and delight. Mix it up, keep your employees on their toes. And they sent me that. And I, like I said, I just moved. It's normally I bring this and shake it because um, it's so cute. But you need to surprise and delight your employees. And so um, down here where it's uh, um, accountability, accept responsibility for all decisions. Your employees see what you do. That low level employee sees when you take your family to Key West for a conference and then you come back and you hand Barb in the office, your Black American Express. And Barbara says, well, so you took, you know, the family. How do you want me to break this out? 
it's none of your business, just pay it. Now, Barb, six weeks, six months, six years, all of a sudden her kid texts her and says, mom, school beach trip this weekend. We're just going to the shore. It's 200 bucks. What does Barb think? My boss took 20 grand out of the business. He's not paying taxes on it. And he's writing the whole trip off for his family. It doesn't make it right, but you need to be fair. You need to be transparent. Now, Barb doesn't know if maybe at the end of the year, he takes an owner's you know, capital. Doesn't know that, but don't give them the opportunity to think that you're not following the same rules that they are, especially in the world that we live in these days. Um, has anyone seen bad education? Isn't it good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know what's... Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, there's a, um, there's a great report about that. The audit report is great. And I know the guy who did it. It's so, it's awesome. So if you want it, email me and I can dig it up and send it. It's really, really good. So um, this came out right at the beginning of COVID. I was so excited for it. What's interesting is the character played by Allison Janney, she passed. She did her time in prison, but she passed afterwards. Um, Frank Tizone, who's played by Hugh Jackman, actually is alive and well and still getting $170,000 a year in his pension. He did pay restitution, but um, also interestingly, she stole more than he did. So again, never underestimate a woman. It is a really good, especially if you're in the education business, it's, it's so good. I, I really, really liked it. Um, it's great. Um, oops, okay, we can't, it won't work on the, yeah. With Frank Tazone, he was on a podcast and he actually said his embezzlement started with two Greek salads and two sodas. He bought them on the weekend and he came in on Monday and no one said anything. And he ended up stealing almost 2 million, I think. I think his was about 2 million. Um, she was quite a bit more, but it started with two Greek salads and two sodas. That's his first step. We don't ever just write a check for $750,000. It's incremental. It's very incremental. Um, so Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, the fruitcake fraud. Scars from the embezzlement are still visible. You can hear the hurt in the way people speak, but there's an undeniable undercurrent of hope still surging, surging throughout the office. Collins Street Bakery is the ultimate comeback kid. Now, also, he kind of has an aptonym, like nut, nuts and fruitcakes. Come on, guys. Um, but I love that. There's an undeniable undercurrent of hope. They survived it. They absolutely survived it. Now, Sandy Jenkins did not survive. He actually committed suicide. That's a red collar crime. So we have all sorts of colors of crime. And as Mary and I were talking at lunch today, he was your advisor, wasn't he? Gil Geis? Gil Geis, famous. Um, he uh, said in 2012, so prescient, white collar, pink collar, no one wears collars these days. That was 10 years ago. So I'm wearing a pink collar. Oops, sorry. Wearing a pink collar. So, um, but money is replaceable. It really is replaceable. And when I say I'm the fraud therapist, it's because the hurt is so deep. It is so, so deep. Again, sell more fruitcakes. They're back on, you know, everyone's still buying fruitcakes. So um, you want to trust every one of your employees. You want to treat them like family, but you also want to verify, and that's for your own protection. And if you don't do that, then you run the risk of being a victim. Um, has anyone read this book, Fraud Points? I know you have. <laughs> um, this is a great book. And this is a woman who, um, uh, this is a woman who her life improved after she um, was embezzled. And how did she find the embezzlement? A snowstorm. Her office manager, her like a family member, couldn't get into work one day because the snow plows in Iowa, I believe it's Iowa, Iowa or Kansas, um, couldn't, she couldn't get out. So Cheryl shows up at work, she gets her mail, and there's a notice from the IRS saying she owes a bunch of money. So Cheryl calls her trusted employee, 
Oh, no, 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 I'm working on it. No, no, don't, don't pay it. You, it's the IRS. They don't know what they're doing. Well, it ended up with penalties because the IRS doesn't care if you got ripped off, you still pay penalties. Um, almost a million dollars. Cheryl has more than tripled her business. She's on, so she's on my podcast and they're still up. Um, I had so much fun with her. I had to make two episodes because she's a chatter, she's a chatterbox. Um, and you cannot believe what she did during the um, podcast. Now I only audio it, but I'm on video. And you know, she's just a sweet grandma. I think she has like 19 grandkids or something. And I'm interviewing her and she goes, you know, Kelly, I used to keep my gun in the, my gun safe and my checkbook in my drawer. And all of a sudden she pulls out her drawer and she pulls out a six shooter. And I was like, ah, you know, like, I mean, I'm only on zoom, but I'm not armed now. And she goes, now I keep my gun in my desk drawer and my checkbook in the safe. True story. It's on the, it's a great podcast. She wrote this book and I don't know how she has time with 19 kids. She runs a huge construction company um, and she wrote this book and she did a great, great job. And actually Cheryl as a victim, me as an investigator and Diane Katanini as a perpetrator, we wanna do a panel to get the different perspectives, the investigator, the victim and the perpetrator. I think it would be so good for business owners to see how it can happen. It's a great book, I highly recommend it. A red flag is a failure. The fraud had already occurred. Instead, look for yellow flags, pink flags, where fraud could occur, but hasn't yet. It is better to look for exposure than evidence. No one wants to pay for fraud prevention. I starve fraud prevention. Like, I mean, it's like, you know, you go into the doctor for a checkup. No one wants to do that. We go in when we get sick and the doctor charges more. That's just how it is. So that's kind of her thing. Um, and then finally, oh, oops, the one last video. Sorry, there's one little clip. Um, oh, oops. No, oh, there's, I forgot. There's one last little one. There are differences between men and women. Oh, oops. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I think we finished right, right about on time. Yeah. Um, questions, comments, tales from the pink collar crime side? Kelly, I have a question. Yes. So one of the uh, points of the fraud triangle is rationalization. And, you know, if with women being shunted to lower level positions, is part of the rationale that you know the company has treated them poorly so it's it's almost like that person who witnessed her boss paying for his entire family's entire vacation and you know darn it if, if he can do that you know i should i'm entitled to more because i've been kind of put in in lower level positions and discriminated against oh that is the best question and i did not feed that to him um so who loves michael lewis the writer, Michael Lewis. Yes. Okay. So he has a podcast. I'm a podcast freak. Um, and this season it's over, but his, it's called L6, uh, episode one, season three, L6. And it is about Gladys in the basement. Gladys is treated poorly. She has a windowless office. Gladys knows all and Gladys can blow everything up. Well, in this podcast with L6, it's an amazing story. So they find a woman, her name is actually Sue. She worked in medical billing and Sue is now a billionaire because she became part of Athena Health. And now I'm not in healthcare, but like healthcare, if you bill for this, you can bill for like five things after it. But if you put the fifth one on the top, you don't get those ones. Well, Sue knew all of it and she, became part of this private equity venture capital fund that ended up becoming, I believe, Athena Health. But Gladys is that person in the basement who can blow everything up and she's treated poorly. They're not paid well. Yet Gladys can literally 
destroy a practice or business overnight. But, so I actually was the victim of a pink collar crime in that my water district was embezzled. And um, she was a control freak. And um, again, apologies to the lawyer, um, lawyers, sorry. Um, they sent her home on a Friday. They didn't remove her remote access and they didn't take her physical access away. So guess what she did over the weekend? Came to the work, shred, she pulled in Arthur Anderson and she blew everything up. And they underestimated her. Like, you know, don't underestimate that person. They just, they know so much. They see so much. They see so much because they're in the office 40 plus hours a week while the CEO is out, you know, flying private and taking his family to Key West or whatever like that. So that rationalization, absolutely. And it's one thing we cannot control for. You could pay Gladys in your medical or dental practice a million dollars a year. But if Gladys has a $2 million a year lifestyle, she's going to be able to rationalize stealing. So we need to be nice to the Gladyses of the world. Okay. And the people who got the book, who the accountants, um, I actually have a stamp. That's one of my hashtag is never underestimate a woman. I had it made literally a week before I heard the podcast and they were like looking for Gladys. And now I want it to be never underestimate Gladys because Gladys knows all. She's smart. Just because you're up here on the org chart doesn't mean you're smarter than here. It's life. It's circumstance. I can show you neurosurgeons. I can show you a guy who did one of the first moonwalks ripped off $750,000. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Yeah, great question. We can't control rationalization, but we can be ethical at work. And if you're not you know, living out of the corporate checkbook, it's harder for them to rationalize taking 200 bucks to send their kid to the beach. So yeah, any other questions? Examples? Tales from the dark side? Okay, Mary, what do you think? About Everything. Am I just... Mary, I'm going to give you a microphone so everyone yeah. can, can hear you. What do you want to add? I would just add, I'm going, to, I'm going to play on this question that we just had, is that one of the things that we look at, and we know from theoretical stances, is that people neutralize their behavior. And there, it's, it was done by Sykes and Mata as the theorist. You first have to neutralize and tell yourself why it's okay to engage in the behavior. Then the argument rationalization comes later. So you can rationalize it later, but in order to make that step over into um, from pink to white, let's say we have to neutralize it. We have to say, um, typically there's no victim. Uh, there's a denial of any injury. There's appeal to higher loyalties. Um, who was it? It was, uh, oh, there's a condemnation of the condemners. Martha Stewart was great. She said that she didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, she was not um, found guilty of insider trading, but she did it. Um, Lied to a federal agent. It was because of harsh prosecutors. She should not have been prosecuted. And that's my lecture for tonight. Let me take this microphone out of my hand. <laughs> I'm very used to talking. <laughs> Yes, very much so. I love Sykes and Matza. I love Sykes and too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anything else? Anybody wants more candy? If you ask a question, we've got more Zots and Skittles, okay? Otherwise, they're going to Kansas City with me. I just have a question about like the biz, how you said that not a lot of the cases make it to like obviously federal and stuff. So a lot of it is just going to be at the local and municipal and city level and things. But I kind of feel like some businesses, like you said, just like the shame, you know, and just everything like there, the embarrassment of it all. Like, I feel like a lot of people might not even get to like a reporting. So do they kind of get stuck in like a, we'll try to work with you before we take you to the cleaners or like. <laughs> okay. So that's the get out of jail free card. Um, actually, I do have one wrong story in my book. I just found out my one wrong story in my book. Um, so that Gladys knows that you write things off that are inappropriately. There was a woman who stole a quarter of a million dollars from an, an abortion clinic in Portland, Oregon. And, um, 
when the owner, the owner wasn't a doctor, it was a business. When the owner found out she stole the money, she went to her and she said, you're fired. We're going to have you prosecuted. The woman said, I am going to turn you into the IRS and the State Department of Revenue because I know you're writing your kid's car off. I know you're paying your home utilities and you're going to be in all sorts of trouble. Now, the business owner is like, fine, do it. I don't care. And, you know, she called her bluff. So that woman, I, oh, I can't remember her name. I want to say it's Catherine. She goes and does Zudu, you know, and then she has restitution and a raging gambling habit. So she goes to a construction company and I get the case of the construction company. And of course I have to reach out to the investigator who did the abortion clinic. And she's like, oh, she's got the get out of jail free card and she's going to pull it on the owner. So I tell the detective, I said, she's going to try and get out of this and she's going to try. And so the detective is like, Ugh, you're so weird. You're such a nerd. Sure enough, business owner, lawyer are there. They confront her and she's like, I have complained about Bob walking by my desk, doing that, and there's Playboys in the bathroom. I'm going to turn you into the Bureau of Labor and Industries. And they're like, yeah, bluff is called. We talked to Kelly. And yeah, and yeah. And then she actually did try to commit suicide, but she failed. Um, thankfully, she did fail. Um, but yeah, so the get out of jail free card, this story is funny in my book. I just found out, um, uh, I just found out from my friend, family business, um, lumber company. My friend was like the bookkeeper. Her brother was the CEO and the a, a sister was silent partner. And, um, my friend noticed that an office manager had gone to Costco and bought jeans and so my friend goes to her brother and says, you need to fire her. And he's like, I'm not going to fire her for buying $70 worth of jeans. Well, it wasn't 70, it was $40,000. But he said, you know what? I'm just going to take it out of her paycheck. That's illegal. Can't do that. Uh-uh. She lasted one paycheck, but he didn't prosecute her. And my friend, the sister is like, oh my God, Eddie, you are so, and he's ethically challenged, let's just say. Um, he's got two sets of books. I'm certain of it. So then another bookkeeper comes along. She steals $500,000. So in the story, I have, I thought it was only one perpetrator. My friend's like, no, actually Eddie let the one with 40,000 go the 500,000. She's like, we never had $500,000 cash when we got our business valuation. And I'm like, um, yeah, you did. And she's like, no, no, we didn't. And I was like, your brother's got two sets of books. He did the valuation based on the lesser of the books. So that's the get out of jail free card. A lot of times that Gladys knows. And if you fire her or him, they're going to threaten you. And you're just going to kick them to the curb and say, I don't ever want to see you again. Leave me alone. I'll never say anything about you. You never say anything about me. So yeah, get out of jail free card. Absolutely. Thank you. Here's a question from uh, the Zoom audience. When it comes to comparing salary to lifestyle, what's the ratio that you consider that would make a lifestyle a red or a yellow or a pink flag? What about an individual's privacy, such as the re receptionist makes $18 an hour, but drives an Escalade? Do you find out if the husband, spouse, partner is well off? Yeah, so you know what? We don't like to talk about money. We just, we'd rather talk about sex, truly. Um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, my husband was a professor and we got sabbatical and we were spending four months in Australia and an attorney I worked with, she looks at me and she's like, um, how do you afford that? Did someone die in your family? And I was like, Jesus, like that is so rude. Um, but I kind of gave her kudos for her asking. Like, we just don't ask those questions. Um, so it is, it's, there is privacy issues. Um, but the parking lot audit, like, I, you know, there are people, Rita Crunwell, who stole $53 million, she had three different stories. She said her family invested in cable TV in the greater Chicagoland area. Then she said her family owned Campbell soup stock. Okay, who buys Campbell's soup anymore? No one. Um, and then third, she said, I had a really wealthy boyfriend and he left it all to me. It was all untrue. But it's, there's a woman who stole $8 million from an Acura dealership back in Pennsylvania. 
And people asked her because she literally flying private, she went and took her family to see the Pope. No kidding, on stolen money. I do not make this up. Um, they asked her, people asked, and she's like, oh, we've been blessed. I have a side business. I got a side, that's the other thing, side hustles. How, I have a neighbor, had a neighbor, who bought a $1.2 million house. They've dumped at least a million into it. He's a cop. And I'm like, a dirty cop? So my husband had met him and right off the bat, he's like, my wife sells online courses. And of course I Googled her and I was like, oh yeah, she is really successful. Um, my husband would have never Googled her. He believed him, but I'm like, I'm checking um, because they have dumped so much money and he's a city cop. Um, so it is really, really hard to do that. I mean, would you say like, oh, I bought Apple stock? It's none of your business, but it can be your business. So when they show up in the Manolos every day, I don't know. I'm Snoopy. I don't know. I'd be doing some snooping. I'd drive by their house. I'd see if it was leased. It's, there's a fine line there. There is a very fine line there. Anything else? Yes. So it's, it seems odd to me that things would go like longer than a year, like when you file your taxes or, I mean, at some point in time, it, it's bizarre that they don't catch it longer than 10 years later. So maybe I don't make enough money <laughs> to not notice that, but it just seems bizarre, even if it's my business, that that can go on for so long in such large chunks that it's unfathomable that people just don't see it, any of it. Yeah. So I call it like the air leaking out of the tires. Um, there's this guy that I know and my uncle who never made more than $250,000 his whole life, he sees a story that this guy who's a very successful businessman has a $250,000 embezzlement. And he posts on Facebook, Jack, isn't it nice that you have $250,000 that can just walk out the door? That's victim shaming because my uncle like never made that kind of money. This guy sells millions of dollars a year of like home hardware stuff. $250,000, I think it was over two years, it's as accountants and auditors would say immaterial. It's the fish tank gets a little more expensive. Do business owners look at ratios really closely when all of a sudden, like I know my sister, she like, what's a ratio? Like, okay, you got to pay attention here. Ratios. Um, so, but it's, it's, rel it's all relative. Yeah. And women do it for longer periods of time for sure. And um, they say women steal for the three C's, cars, clothing, and casinos. And men steal for the, there's a couple of different ones. I don't know, if, I'm trying to think of which is the most least inappropriate, yeah, least insulting. Um, uh, okay, oh God. <laughs> okay, um, the three B's, booze, broads, and bets. Um, so yeah, you know, alliteration. Um, it doesn't go so well sometimes. I'm sure I'm going to be canceled. I don't, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Here's a, another question from Zoom. And we can, um, we appreciate the School of Public Affairs support for a lot of our Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative program. So if you wouldn't mind, this could be for both of you. Um, how do we have conversations like this in the classroom with college students? Okay. Yeah. I have the perfect answer. We have these conversations in my white collar crime class, uh, which also includes covering pink collar crime. Uh, sometimes white collar crime becomes involved in red collar crime, which is, involves murder. If you look at uh, some of the toxic dumping, the green, green criminology. So that is how we do it. That's how I do it. In fact, I'll be teaching white collar crime next semester. Quite excited about it. <laughs> We've got a lot to talk about with Elizabeth Holmes and uh, uh, our former president. So I'll say that very quietly. But yeah, so that's how we do it. And I try to bring it into most of my criminology classes. Yeah, it's difficult. I teach theory, so it's difficult not to talk about 
uh, pink collar crime, white collar crime in a theory class. So yeah, take my classes. They're great. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could take them. Oh, and then this is one other thing that, um, okay, so talking about it, it's so important to talk about it. Also for students, I have a, um, I teach a lot of students and um, you got to have, I'll be politically correct, the walk away fund. I call it a different fund in private, but the walk away fund. Um, and if you don't have the walk away fund, you have the attitude of having the walk away fund because at some point in your life, you will be asked to do something unless you have Kelly's bubble. So my boss that had the three letter ending with a BI, um, uh, you know, agency, he knew I wouldn't cross the line. He never asked me to do something. My peer, oh, he asked her and she did it because he knew she, she, you can have that kind of sense. And it's good if you have the money to be able to walk away. I teach my kids this all the time. I'm like, you are very privileged that you can always walk away. In my twenties, I needed a job. I couldn't walk away, but I had, I had my force field and people didn't mess with it. Um, one of the last things, oh my gosh. Okay. So you guys have gotten my book. My daughter calls it a pamphlet. It's over a hundred pages, just FYI. Um, this book is a pamphlet and it's expensive. It's like 40 bucks on ABE and it's like 40 pages, a dollar page. It's a lot. Um, a thousand and one embezzlers, a study of defalcations in business. This was done in 1937 and it's um, insurance companies that had to pay out, you know, embezzlement claims. A thousand and one embezzlers. Guess how many were women? This is 1937. Guess how many were women? I've got prizes. Half? Who said a half? Okay, yeah, nowhere close. Um, mm, you're close. 37. Out of a thousand and one embezzlers in 1937, only 37 were women. That goes to show that um, uh, women have made great strides in embezzling, okay? They have made great strides. And then to, um, like this book, it's just, oh my God, it's so genius. So dishonesty, being as old as humanity, is no more a phenomenon of the present times, 1937, than are the other violations of the Ten Commandments. Nor is the embezzler peculiar to any one city, climate, or business. He is usually not of the criminal type. In general, he has held a position of some trust and responsibility and has enjoyed a good reputation. Like, oh my God, this book is genius. And we're recreating it with a friend. So, because this goes on to show stories like trouble and more trouble. Number seven dash MF dash three was married. And at the age of 40 had three dependents. He had been employed as a bookkeeper. He stole two grand. So they give all these stories like he had a mistress. I mean, this book is genius and it's based on real insurance claims when a business was embezzled. It is, this is the data that I need that I have finally found. So, yeah. Sorry, this is really great stuff to bring into ethics classes. I mean, when I just was looking at Daniel's fund, I thought, why wouldn't you want to talk about white collar crime and pink collar crime in an ethics class? So many great examples and uh, things to go off on. <laughs> Kelly, we wanted to thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for Kelly. <laughs> Also would like to thank our invaluable um, Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative uh, staff, Michaela Erickson, uh, Director of Events, and Alyssa Landa, our Program Coordinator. And Amanda Gonzalez is also here helping us quite a bit from the Events Department. Thank you. Uh, the, there'll be a networking reception in just a minute, but first we're gonna hear from Carol D. Carol is the Chair of our Accounting Program, which is one of our co presenters today. Carol, thank you. Hi, I just wanted to uh, quickly thank uh, our accounting alums who showed up tonight. Um, my name is Carol D. I'm the new director of accounting programs here at CU Denver, uh, taking over from Gary Colbert. And I just want to thank our alums who showed up. Um, I have a lot of great things to say about the program, but I uh, didn't want to drag things on. 
But uh, the accounting program here is growing. We've grown 39% over the past five years. Uh, we have now over 500 students. Um, I also want to put in a plug for our uh, scholarship fund. <laughs> um, last year, we gave uh, over $12,000 worth of scholarships. We're hoping to increase that now that we're after COVID. So if you're interested in uh, donating to our accounting scholarship fund, I will certainly uh, help you with that. And there's a booth in the back where you can take care of that. Also, I want to put in a short plug for our ad accounting advisory council. So we have a very active um, advisory council. We're always looking for new members in the business community. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Well, you're all free to go back and get some more food and um, beverage. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for getting out of the house and getting dressed.